I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker. You've seen Patty Lovett Reed as Chief Financial Commentator for CTV News for almost a decade, following her successful career as a VP at TD Bank. Or you may be one of the tens of thousands who follow her on social as she shares both financial and lifestyle insights. Patty draws on her expertise to share an economic overview of the issues that impact our finances, including the job market, real estate, inflation, and more. Patty will identify what's actually in your control and share strategies that you can incorporate into your everyday financial plan. She'll touch on the common financial myths that often hold individuals back from taking control of their personal wealth. So here's to feeling empowered, educated, and ready to take a step forward to financial security. Welcome, Patty. Wow, Teresa, thank you so much. What you failed to mention, though, is that you and I have known each other for decades and decades. Yeah. That was probably a good thing that that was overlooked, but thank you so much. I am absolutely delighted to be here. You know, I was thinking about what I might talk about, and sure, we could talk about the economy, we could talk about the job market, inflation, real estate, but I'm not an economist. But what I do do is I look at all this data, and the reason I look at it is because it impacts every single one of us. I would argue that uh, last Friday when we had the job report for the month of September, you probably didn't really care that much about it if you had a job. You might not even be thinking about the job market until maybe your neighbor loses their job and they talk to you or you lose your job. When it comes to the real estate market, you know, there are some suggesting, TD is one of them, that from the first quarter of 2022 through the first quarter of 2023, we could see real estate prices drop anywhere from 20 to 25 percent. But does that matter to you? Well, maybe in terms of your net worth and what you see on paper, but if you're not buying and selling, you might think, okay, I've got time on my side. Inflation. We're always talking about inflation. Inflation right now stands at 7%. That doesn't mean that your inflation number is 7% because your basket of goods could be very different from the basket of goods that Stats Canada measures against or anyone else's for that matter. And then you've got growth in the economy and July eked out a gain of 0.1%. I gotta tell you, I was pretty happy about that number. I do get excited about certain economic numbers, but if we have growth of 0.1% or a contraction of 0.1%, is it really going to matter to you? Maybe or maybe not. Now, I always like to update numbers prior to doing a presentation. I want to have my finger on the pulse of what's going on, but I also think it's really important to control what you can in basically an environment that you feel like everything is out of control. So one of the areas would be the stock market. The S&P TSX is down about 14 to 14 and a half percent so far this year. Does that mean your portfolio is down that much? Not necessarily. So I do think it's important to know your numbers. Uh, I also will say that when we talk about inflation, let's say you decided to buy that really expensive whatever and prices continue to go higher and higher. You're going to buy it because you think they're going to go even higher. And you think, am I contributing to inflation? Maybe. But here's the knock-on effect. Let's say you decide to buy a designer coffee. You may decide to buy one every day, or you may treat yourself once a week. As prices go higher due to the war in Ukraine, it could be supply chain challenges. There are a whole host of reasons. As long as you are prepared to pay more and more for that coffee, you continue to buy it, the profits of that company will grow. They tend to perform very well in the stock market. What happens on that day where you go, enough, I'm done doing it. You're not going to have an impact on the inflation number, but what if everybody starts to think the way you do? And that coffee chain has to bring down prices to get customers back in the door. That eats at profits. There you see the volatility in the market. So you have some control, but you don't entirely control what's going on. Here is one area, though, I do think you have a lot of control. And as a result of being in the media for the past decade, 
I know what goes into programming. I know on some all news areas where I've worked in the past, you have to come up with 12 hours of programming. Some of it can be very negative. Some of it can be very robust. Some of it can be overly optimistic. You can control how much of this you take away, how much you decide to explore further. And if it's a very negative environment, naturally you're going to have negative feelings. So I sort of put the context of what's been going on in 2022 here, where we don't have control over the stock market. We don't really have control over inflation. The job market, the good news there is there are still a million vacancies out there. So you have a bit of control. If you do lose your job, you could find another one. And the real estate market, rates are going higher. That's not within your control. Whether they hit 4%, which it's largely expected by many economists by the end of the year, you control how you respond. And so that's what I really want to talk about. So I have a few things here that I think can be very harmful to your own personal financial situation. The first one that I highlight here is uh, not paying attention to your asset allocation, how much money you have in cash, in bonds, and in stocks. I say that because it all comes down to risk. When people will say to me, and thanks, Teresa, for commenting on my social media, I get a lot of direct messages on Instagram and people will say, um, should I sell out of this position? I'm not sleeping. My portfolio's down. Will it bounce back next year? Some I have answers to, but, but not all. And it's very difficult to give out personal financial advice with just this much information. But what you can do is you can say to people, how much can you afford to lose in your portfolio and how much are you willing to lose? And those are two very different questions that you ask yourself. The other side of that is, do you even have a plan in place? I can tell you in our household for my husband and I've been married 28 years. So going back 28 years between Christmas and New Year's, we decide we're going to do our net worth statement and we have every year and we've kept every single one of them. And what we do is we list down everything that we own, everything that we owe, and the difference between the two is our net worth. Now, typically year after year, and there have been some bumps along the way, we want to improve that net worth. So if you ask us, we develop our goals from our net worth. And so in my household, I would say, hmm, we have debt here. Let's retire that debt. Let's pay off the mortgage. Let's not worry about the mortgage. The rate's really low. We might get a better return in the market. Let's put it into our RSP this year. Take that money and put it on the mortgage. You sort of see where I'm going. But also, when you do a net worth, you might be surprised just how well you've done. And you might feel better about your financial situation, and it helps to establish goals. Uh, the past year, I talked about the markets, and literally, there has been nowhere to hide. But we got very lucky. Uh, our daughter, who lives just outside of Peterborough, uh, said one day, there's a house across the street on the water, Mom, and she knows money, and she talks about it with me. Here's a great diversification play. Take some money out of the market. Put it in here. Waterfront property, you won't go wrong, and you'll be across the street from us. This is an emotional play on my part. I did it. But we took money out of the bond market to pay for this house. And then the bond market went on to have its worst performance going back to the Second World War. Now, am I smart? No, I'm not. And do I believe in my own predictive powers here? No, because I don't think anyone can really time the market. And even if you try to, you have to get it right twice, going in and coming out. But paying attention to your asset allocation, like I was referring to, means that there is an opportunity to buy in at certain times. And I'm going to give you a list of a few companies where I'm thinking, rarely do leaders in their industry go on sale. I'm going to talk about Amazon. That stock, world's greatest retailer by just about any standards, down 40%. I would say Microsoft, probably one of the best in the world in terms of software makers, down 33%. And if you decide to search anything, you likely go on Google and its parent alphabet is off about 30%. My point is 
when you're looking at what you're holding, understand that you want good quality companies that are leaders in their industry. And if they pay you a dividend, they're paying you to wait. Um, you know, these are turbulent times. I want to give you an illustration of something that you can do to sort of take all the emotion out of investing. Uh, I loved this report. My financial advisor gave it to me, this, this sort of graphic, a couple of weeks ago, because I am a certified financial planner, but we have an advisor looking after our money for a couple of reasons. One, um, I talk about stocks, and if I talk about them and then I own them, I could be a front runner and I watch the stock run up and then I may decide to sell and then I don't tell everybody that I've sold now. And so therefore I have someone else managing our portfolio. But here's the illustration he gave me. He said, Patty, if you had $10,000 and you put it in the S&P TSX 30 years ago, and 30 years ago, I may have done that, just that. And that's December 31st, uh, 1991 and you held it to December 31st, 2021, there have been ups and downs in the market. If you left it alone, didn't try to time the market, strip the emotion out of investing, that $10,000 would be worth just over $60,000. If you tried to time the market and miss just the 1% of the best trading days during that same 30-year period, the $10,000 you would have invested would have been worth at the end of December 31st, uh, 2021, 3,700. The point is we don't know when these markets are going to rebound. We really don't. We may have some idea. There may be some false starts, but trying to get in and out, the market upside potential is huge. And it often happens when you least expect it. Just before I came on air here, I looked at some recent research and it's about behaviors. What happened during uh, the financial crisis in 2008, 30% of those surveyed pulled out of the market and never went back in. Well, when the market started to turn, the S&P 500, arguably one of the best stock markets out there, went from 667 to 4,809 points. Over the last 12 years, that is a gain of 618%, which is why I think it's so important that people think about time in the market, not trying to time the market. Even though doing nothing feels like, ah, and trust me, those, I'm not sure that's a technical term, ah, but that's how you feel. It's gut wrenching. And there's a term being thrown around by institutional investors right now, and it's called capitulation. That is when the last retail investor, like us, say, I can't take this volatility anymore. I am throwing in the towel and I'm moving to the sidelines. They're waiting for that because they will be picking up the good quality companies that we were smart enough to put in our portfolio at bargain prices. And we have now locked in our game. So a couple of mistakes that I think people are making, but probably shouldn't. Look at your portfolios right now. Um, don't fall in love with your assets. We once had a home. It was my dream home. And it was an expensive home and we did not have any financial wiggle room. So my husband and I looked at each other and said, you know what? It's time to sell. We're going to move out of here and into something else where we can live a more balanced life. Could we afford it? Yes. But was it comfortable? No. When people buy into a particular stock, nobody buys in thinking, okay, um, this is going to be a dog, but it could be a dog. People typically buy in and say it's going to go higher and higher and higher. Eventually, there's an opportunity cost by hanging on to that just too long. So you owe it to yourself to say, I'm not in love with these assets. I'm building a portfolio. I've got at least a five-year time horizon, and I'm going to get through this. Don't abdicate responsibility to anyone else. Uh, even your financial advisor, you can imagine I'm not the best client to have. I'm probably a bit of a challenge to our advisor but I ask questions. I want to know what they're doing. People don't often leave their advisor because they have misrepresented them or not invested appropriately. But in periods like this, if you've not heard from your advisor, I'd ask why. 
because money is mobile. It'll go in a heartbeat to someone else. It's scarce. There's not a lot of it. And it's sensitive to interest rate movements. And I say sensitive because if anybody's been watching, like I have the US dollar rocket, that's about the only place you could have hidden uh, so far this year. It has done exceptionally well because the Fed is raising rates. Um, be financially um, financially aware of what you're paying for your services. You think you're getting the lowest price? You're not. You're probably not. I already talked about your net worth, but here is a piece of advice that I received. Um, and I received this, well, um, I was at my mother-in-law's funeral and I was in my early 40s. And one of her colleagues, she had been a nurse, came forward and said to me, are you open to some feedback, Patty? And I said, yes, I definitely am always open to feedback. And she said, your golden years are right now. And I thought, wait a minute, I my golden years now? And she said, they are right now. None of us know how long we have, like none of us do. And so I don't want you to save until it hurts. I don't want you to spend as if there's no tomorrow. It's about having a balance because as I said, you know, you just don't know. My biological father died at the age of 36. I was nine at the time and he died of a massive heart attack. It happened very suddenly. So you just don't know. Now, before I run out of time and in a presentation, I can break down any of these elements in a lot more ways um, and I can elaborate. And of course, I would have a lot more stories to sort of drive home the point. But I think one of the best ways to get through this environment is to have a millionaire mentality. When I worked for a financial institution, I gathered research because I had the opportunity for a decade to speak to people who had a net worth of $25 million or more. And what is it they do differently than the rest of us? Here's a sneak peek. Uh, they don't spend frivolously. One gentleman came to presentation after presentation after presentation I did for five years in a row in the same sweater. We got to know each other. We started joking about it. And he said, there's nothing wrong with this sweater. Just because I can't afford to do it doesn't mean I should. And I'm going to keep on wearing it. And he did. Uh, people, uh, those who have a millionaire mentality, focus in on asset accumulation. They do not have payments that are never ending in a sinkhole. Look at your payments that are coming out regularly and can you get rid of them and put that money to better use? They never borrow to um, consume. They only borrow, and the interest is deductible, to invest. Uh, they're financially realistic. That makes sense. They do have an emergency fund. No one wants to sell out of a stock that is a good quality company, a leader in their industry, and has been taken down like everybody else has. They have that emergency fund or they have access to a line of credit or a credit card that they never use. They don't let cash sit idly for too long, although a lot of people have cash right now, and that's not a bad thing. Just don't leave it there forever. After taxes and inflation, you are losing money. Um, flexible with their financial plan. These things aren't carved in stone. They can be very flexible. And here's one that I want to share with you. They're always looking for the next big thing. Think about it. I retired from CTV. Every single freelance opportunity I have had has come my way via Instagram. Every single one. I never saw it coming. Um, I, I think that you have to be open to what's around the corner because it just might be there and you get to embrace it. And these people as well, always, always think about legacy. And legacy isn't just uh, leaving money. Uh, it could be leaving, leaving values, sharing insight. I'll end with the one that in our household during COVID, we weren't sure how to help and how to get the most impact out of the help we were willing to provide. So we undertook uh, a relationship with a small business owner and we helped them out financially. They said, we can't pay this back. And I said, that's okay, pay it back in a decade. They kind of laughed in a decade. No, I said, pay it back in a hundred years. They laughed and they said, you might not be here. And I said, oh, well, I guess it's forgiven. But then I shared that story with our adult children. And what I found fascinating is how they embraced it. And so a legacy does not mean 
at end of life. A legacy is about lifelong learning. So in the interest of time, I clearly could go on and on. Uh, I am more than happy to take your questions. I also, in case anyone's interested, have sort of the motivational side, the power of momentum and some of life's experiences that can be shared more broadly as well. And I'm happy to answer any question. Teresa. Thank you, Patty. Uh, really insightful balance of kind of the mindset as well as what's happening in the marketplace. Um, and uh, we're, I've made a lot of notes that I need to like look into a little bit more to make sure I'm actually, uh, I think, being proactive and responsible financially. So thank you for that. <laughs> you good. Uh, Yay. Yes. <laughs> One person. <laughs> And uh, and as you touched on, I mean, I know we've known each other for such a long time, and I have to say, your advice sticks. So uh, it was like a long time ago where I remember a phrase that has stayed in my head when um, I was looking to make a big investment, like buying a house. And I can still hear you saying, "You need to think every day: Do I want this house more, or do I want this coffee more?" And yeah. every right. bit of money, you know, if you don't buy that coffee, it can go into your house fund. Yeah. Um, can you touch on that a little bit in terms of um, having that sort of mindset? Sure. I, I mean, there is only so much money that people have, and I get that. And this is distinguishing between a need and a want. Um, I remember at a very young age talking to my daughter, Jane, and she got her first job. And I said, here's what you should save your money for. I don't know what I said, but she quickly came back to me and I'll never forget that. And she said, well, that doesn't excite me. It excites you, but it doesn't excite me. And the lesson I learned is even if your financial advisor says you should be saving for retirement and that's not going to excite you, it's not going to force you to give up some of the things you like right now. You're never going to do it. So your goals have to be yours. You own them. You get excited about them and then you'll make changes. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Sheldon has a question about, um, is it okay to rent and build an investment portfolio instead of jumping into the housing market right now? Absolutely it is. And the fact is, uh, Sheldon is a pretty savvy individual to say, it just because I'm not in the housing market, which becomes a forced savings because you have a mortgage payment that you have to make. But that doesn't mean it's the right thing. And some people still believe that the housing market is very overvalued. And given where rates are going, they may decide that over time, I'm going to build up my investment portfolio. And, you know, a house can be a money pit. It isn't for everyone. And depending on where you're prepared to live, um, home ownership just simply may not make sense. And so if you're someone who has to be in an urban center because that's the lifestyle that you want in a, a business district that you need to be in, it may not make sense. So I, I think we've got to move away from home ownership is absolutely the be all and end all for everyone. Thank you for that. And there's another question related to housing from... Oh, mm -hmm. just uh, popped off my screen. Oh, here we go. Uh, from, <laughs> from Tiana. Uh, is a variable rate for a mortgage okay in this market? Or when do you go to fixed? Do you have a perspective <laughs> there? I, well, I do have a perspective, but I don't have the answer. Uh, even with our adult children, uh, I get opposing views and it's a lively dinner conversation. Uh, our whole life, we've been very somewhat adverse to risk. I don't tend to borrow to invest. Um, I wanted to retire debt aggressively, retire mortgages aggressively. And I always went with a fixed rate because that's what I was comfortable with. But um, I know variable has been the place to be. And some believe that the Bank of Canada will continue raising rates. They'll overshoot what they need to do. And then they'll have to pull back. Our oldest daughter, Carolyn, says, I am in a variable rate. I'm comfortable being in a variable rate. And it may mean I don't go on a vacation this year, but I think in the long run, that's the place to be. So the moral of the story is understand what you're paying. Know when something's coming up for renewal. I'm not saying you can time this, but look at your household. If you have two people with very steady jobs and incomes and you don't have to worry about the variance from an income flow perspective, 
you may be very comfortable in a variable. If you're someone else who's like freelance and doing whatever, um, you may want to lock in that payment. Depends on your personality too. Thank you. And another question from Shauna related to women. Uh, yes. How do you encourage young women to be interested in managing their own finances? Absolutely. Yes. I think it's about playing to your strengths. And if it's something that you are passionate about and you start to understand it, look, I have written so many books on women and money and we've come a long way. Uh, there's just no question about it. But I will give you the example, not just young women, my own mother, who is almost 90. Uh, when my father passed away, she remarried. So my second father, when he passed away, I assume because I'm in the business, I'm a certified financial planner, I will step in and manage your money for you, mom, because I knew my father had done it. And she said, not so fast. Um, I'm quite capable. Just because I didn't do it doesn't mean I'm not aware. And if I need help, I'll ask you for it. That's my mother. <laughs> and so, you know, to be honest with you, she does manage her money. We have my brother and I have power of attorney, but she wants a quarterly update all the time. So, yes, women are managing their money more and more. And I think that's a good thing. Not everybody likes it. Be involved doesn't mean, you know, you abdicate, though. Excellent. Thank you. And I think that ties into a comment or question also that was in the chat, um, which I would extend a little bit. There's a comment about uh, the mindset of living paycheck to paycheck versus saving and getting out of debt. Yes. You know what? Um, yeah. One of the things I learned years and years ago, you create wealth, not by how much you earn, but by how little you spend. And that is a very important um, element because lifestyle drives everything. So, you know, for some getting out of debt is, is aggressive and that's important, but I know some very, very wealthy people who spend and spend and spend and spend. And actually at the end of the day, they may look like they're much further ahead than you, but you can't compare yourself to the Joneses because they may well be broke and you don't know it. All you're seeing is sort of the flashy, you know, cars in the driveway, the designer home, the designer, um, the Tony neighborhood, the great clothes, all this sort of thing. But deep down, you know, how much of it are they financing? Yes, it's that visible versus you never know what's going on behind the scenes with people. So, yeah. And can I, can, I, can I just add one more element? Mm -hmm. I was just thinking about it. You can have two people, let's say, who are in their 40s, 40, two 40-year-olds 40 or 35-year-olds, and you think they're identical. They sort of live in the same neighborhood. They have a similar type of job. They have a similar background. The point is, behind the scenes, you don't know if life has thrown them a curveball. You don't know if they're caring for an aging a relative um, or someone who is ill, or they may be on a second marriage. And, you know, they may have two children from their first marriage who are off on their post-secondary education. And lo and behold, the other partner now has two more coming up. So they're at the same age, but you, they're at different stages in their life. So that's the importance of that financial plan because no two people are alike. Yes. Thank you so much for this session, Patty. And again, balancing Thank the uh, mindset as well as the market. I can see uh, some of the feedback from the audience in the chat already. Uh, Donna's going to do more frequent updates with her financial advisor. Um, and there's appreciation for your millionaire mindset. So thank you so much for the insights you've provided today. Thank you so much for featuring me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Very good to see you this way and in person. I know uh, soon, of course, with more uh, in-person events coming up. Uh, really appreciate our audience's engagement and interaction today. I can see awesome insight, very helpful, great suggestions. Uh, love seeing those comments in the chat. And uh, we look forward to uh, helping your audience with uh, bringing great speakers to your uh, coming events. And hopefully uh, with the insights from Patty, you'll be able to extend those to your audiences and team as well. We will see you again in a couple of weeks and uh, hope everyone does well. Thanks and take care. Bye.